There we go. Thank you so much for joining us for this very special edition of ArcView Access. We have two members of Congress uh, with us today, as well as a whole host of other top experts looking at the politics of cannabis and how that impacts uh, the business of cannabis and investment in cannabis as well. Um, and um, kudos to Erica and Carolyn on our team for that opening music. I don't know if you were one of the people who were on the early side, but we're really moving on up here uh, at ArcView. We now have you know, brought back music uh, into, our, into our webinars. So hopefully um, uh, that'll be a, a fun little uh, addition for you. Um, if you're new to ArcView, um, ArcView is the first and largest group of cannabis investors. Um, in the cannabis sector, and we also are the leading publisher of market research um, for the sector. We just came out with our eighth edition of the State of Legal Cannabis Markets, um, which you can find on our website, published in partnership with BDS Analytics. Um, and, um, you know, we're coming to you, you know, live today at a very interesting time in American history um, with COVID-19 and also um, all that's been happening over the last couple weeks around race. Um, it's very clear uh, that we've, you know, come a long way in our country over many decades and centuries um, in overcoming racism, but uh, the uh, killing of George Floyd and Armand Aubrey um, and the Central Park incident with Christian Cooper um, has given us all very painful examples um, to remind us that we have much further to go um, and that we all have a role to play in doing that. Um, you'll have an opportunity in this um, webinar to hear from the heads of two different organizations uh, that are working to end cannabis prohibition. Um, one of the main ways in which um, police interact with people of color is over cannabis. Um, and so the sooner we can get cannabis um, off the table in those interactions, um, that can have some impact. And obviously it's just one thing in a whole host of things we need to do um, to stop this madness. And um, my heart also goes out um, to those affected um, by the violence and, and property uh, destruction um, that we've seen across cities um, by those kind of taking advantage of the cover provided by really peaceful protesters making their voice heard. Um, many of our members um, and some that are, are not our members, but part of our community who um, run dispensaries or work at dispensaries um, have had their um, had had have been targeted over these last um, week or so. Um, and one of the reasons they're targeted is because that's where cash is, right? And um, the reason why there's so much cash there is because of the banking problems um, that we have at the federal level. Um, so once again, there's another intersection point uh, here um, uh, with that. But um, either way, uh, you know, Regardless of its intersection with our issues, I just want to um, wish you and your family um, both inner and outer peace um, and health um, during this time of pandemic and unrest. Um, one of the, my favorite quotes, um, and, and quote that partially inspired um, the ArcView name too, is a quote by Martin Luther King where he said that the arc of history is long, but it bends towards justice. Um, and may, may we all commit to um, creating a more just world. Um, and with that, I will um, share a little bit about our, our program today. Um, it is sponsored by Transact First, um, which is a leading payment processor point of banking solution for the cannabis space. And we'll close out today uh, with their director of sales, Justin Friedberg, um, in Jake's corner to share some tips and tricks around uh, the changing face of cannabis banking. Um, and they're also offering a special uh, to provide free terminals for anyone who connects with Transact First within a week 
um, and mentions this webinar. Uh, a little note, usually these programs are 60 minutes, but today it's going to be 90 minutes because we have such a full packed program with so many great experts. Um, and for those that complete the survey uh, to commemorate our 10th anniversary, we'll randomly select 10 winners to be mailed a special gift. They haven't even told me what the gift is, so must be pretty good. Um, this week we're going to be talking about federal reform. Um, <laughs> we've been talking about federal reform for a long time. I've been involved in fighting for legalization since 1995. Um, and, uh, you know, Congress always seems to be the last body to do anything um, uh, politically. Um, and, and that's the case here where we have such uh, amazing public support um, and many states that have changed their laws. Um, but movement at the federal level has been incredibly difficult. Um, but many people on both sides of the aisle are very, very excited about the possibility for reform soon, possibly even this year. And, um, and what that means um, for our movement um, and for businesses in this space and for investors in this space um, is going to be um, a really important uh, time to discuss that. Um, I'll be fielding questions during the program and addressing them along the way as possible. If you post a question, please state who your question is directed to. And for questions we can't get to today, um, you can visit ArcView's LinkedIn Lounge, um, where we'll address them after the program. And you can see there's a little Q&A in there. You can kind of um, just do that throughout the time. I'm not going to invite you to do that. You can just kind of put Q&A in there as you see fit and I'll I'll scroll through it um, when we have time. Uh, and um, for those of you who don't know, I'm Troy Dayton. I am a co-founder and chief strategy officer uh, at the ArcView Group. And um, as you heard earlier, it is our 10 year anniversary of bringing people together in this industry. Um, so I'm glad to have you with us. Um, today we have, um, representative Earl Blumenhauer, um, who is a uh, representative um, from Oregon, Democrat, um, who's been um, serving as a, a member of Congress for many years um, and has been working on uh, you know, cannabis legalization for, for decades um, and a real champion long before it was popular. We also have Senator U.S. Senator Cory Gardner, um, a Republican senator from Colorado, um, who uh, famously held up judicial nominees um, uh, in order to get support for um, states' rights uh, in with with cannabis, um, and uh, represented his state, uh, Colorado, there. So one of the chief leading um, proponents among the Republicans, um, standing up for this issue. Um, and then after that, we're going to have um, Steve Hawkins, um, who is the executive director of the Marijuana Policy Project, um, where I serve as chair of the board. Um, and they work m m at the federal level, but also at the state level, uh, passing laws all across the country. And so who will get a chance to hear how that all intersects. And then Aaron Smith um, is the uh, co-founder of the National Cannabis Industry Association, of which I also serve on the board uh, there, and they represent um, thousands of cannabis businesses um, at the federal level. Uh, and then after that, we're going to hear from Lifetime ArcView member and active cannabis investor Alan Bankier, as well as Gene Sullivan, longtime venture capitalist uh, with ArcView Ventures. And then after we're done, um, if you are an ArcView member, you are invited to hang out afterwards. You know, this is sort of the formal aspect of it. Um, after, after this, um, we'll have uh, some time for members to just sort of hang out um, and would love for you to join us uh, for that. We'll just chat about the topics of the day in more of a relaxed atmosphere like, like we might if we were actually at an ArcView event, um, which would be great. Um, and we're also going to have our uh, CEO, uh, Kim Kovacs, uh, there as well, um, who's always looking to get a chance to get to know more members. Um, and so if you're a member, check your email for a very special link. Um, and so with that, let's bring uh, 
uh, Senator Cory Gardner and Representative Earl Blumenauer uh, to, the, to the stage. <laughs> hey, Cory, how are you? Oh, Good, how are you? Thanks for having me. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for, for being here. Um, and uh, we'll get Earl on here in a second. Um, but um, yeah, very, uh, very interesting time. So maybe a good place to start, um, Corey, is to share a little bit about how you got interested in the cannabis sector um, and maybe a little bit about what that's been like to be a, uh, a Republican um, out in favor of cannabis legalization. Yeah, you know, it, it's, it's, there's some, some incredible conversations that, uh, that I've had a window into, into the politics of this, the, the evolution of this, uh, how Colorado has sort of pioneered this, and uh, what's happened since that moment in the late uh, 2000s uh, through uh, today. Uh, you know, I, I think one of the most critical instrumental moments I had in my public policy uh, career was to, you know, meet with Sal Pace, uh, Colorado, that many people on this call know, who convened a group of people uh, around the room in Colorado Springs, uh, people who were you know, representing a variety of businesses uh, in the cannabis industry, talking about their experiences, talking about what it meant to be in business, their employees, the lack of banking access, the taxes, those kinds of things. And it was that moment when they said, hey, we need your help. And I, listening to them, seeing how professional everyone was and the, the, just the, the genuine need for action, and you said Congress uh, doesn't act very well. Look, Congress is really, really bad at a lot of things. One thing it's very, very good in is sticking its head in the sand, uh, and that's what it had been doing. And so, uh, you know, this meeting was instrumental and pivotal in terms of moving forward with a way to, right, how can we break this logjam? You know, you see Republicans over here, you see Democrats over here, but there's a lot of people who have common ground. How do we find that? How can we overcome some of these I'm in my corner, you're in your corner, and we're not going to talk. And we came up with the States Act. Elizabeth Warren, uh, uh, Maria Cantwell, uh, my, myself, uh, Steve Daines, a lot of people around the table saying, what are we going to do? How do we fix this? And that's the idea that we came up with. And of course, the Safe Banking Act that I'm carrying with uh, Senator Merkley from Oregon uh, in, in the Senate to address that. That's really how we got involved. But, uh, you know, it, it started with that, uh, I think, just you know, very publicly, with the decision by then Attorney General Jeff Sessions to withdraw the coal memorandum. And, you know, at that moment, remember what happened? He had come to all of us saying, no, I think status quo, look, if a county sheriff's not going to get involved in Colorado, then I'm not going to get involved and we'll just leave it at that and not going to mess with anything. And then the first thing he does is that. And that's when you saw that floor speech. I was very frustrated because I, uh, you know, knew it was the wrong thing to do, the wrong approach, and was, you know, something out of the writers of Leave It to, the, to, to Beaver uh, instead of actually what we needed to do. Uh, and uh, that's, you know, really kind of launched that how we work. Yeah, that's, that's, that's amazing. Um, thank you for, for, for doing that and standing up in that way. Um, and uh, it, 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 it worked, it worked for the moment, right? It, it really yeah. made a, made a big difference. Um, uh, Earl, um, I, I can tell that you're with us um, with audio, but we don't have your video. Can you, can you hear us? Uh, yes, why don't I give you a little video if you're ready for yeah, that. that? There we are, yay, perfect. And of course, you guys know each other well, I assume. Right. Um, Served together in the house before he ran away. <laughs> I, I am house broken. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, um, and this is, this is rare, right? I mean, you know, how many issues uh, right now in the world can Democrats and Republicans um, from different houses be able to sit down and, and be able to have a, a conversation where I assume you guys mostly agree with each other on, on this issue? Well, ironically, uh, you don't hear much about it uh, in the news media and things are hopelessly polarized with uh, uh, well, I'm, I'm no fan of Donald Trump, and I think he's making things worse. Uh, but there are a variety of areas that we work together. I'm, I'm working with uh, Senator Weicker on a program to rescue restaurants. Uh, I just got off uh, the phone with a, a bipartisan animal welfare caucus where we work together. Uh, and in cannabis in the House of Representatives, uh, we have moved together for a decade on a bipartisan basis to make some significant progress. I'll leave uh, the Senate to Corey and let him navigate that. Uh, although I did uh, introduce the, uh, uh, 
the States Act in the House as a prime as the chief co-sponsor and move that forward. We've got an array of items going forward. But just let me say, I mean, I have in fact been doing this since 1973. Uh, I was involved with the leadership that provided Oregon being the very first state to decriminalize cannabis. Um, and ever since then, I have been totally committed to ending this failed policy of prohibition. And in fact, part of what we're seeing playing out on our streets now uh, is a result of this failed policy of prohibition that has been inflicted disproportionately against people of color, particularly young African-American men, destroying perhaps a million lives and having people ending up uh, incarcerated who had no business being there. Uh, so this is uh, a mission that I have had uh, for decades. I am proud of what we've done in the House. We have I organized a bipartisan cannabis caucus, um, uh, particularly Dave Joyce, uh, uh, a Republican from Ohio, uh, Don Young from Alaska, Republican, with Barbara Lee, uh, where we've uh, been able to make significant progress. Um, Ed Perlmutter, uh, uh, a Coloradan, uh, was uh, on point for us with the Safe Banking Act, which passed overwhelmingly in the House. We've been working on it for years. We've had some successful strategies to uh, hold the Department of Justice at bay. Uh, but this uh, passed with 321 votes, every single Democrat but one. And we had about 40% of the Republican caucus. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's teed up and ready to go in the, let's, uh, in the Senate. Let's we, pause. We, we published let's... a blueprint at the beginning of this Congress that's available to anybody who wants to look at mm -hmm. it, that uh, identified areas for each major committee in the House. Mm -hmm. And we have had unprecedented progress in each of those areas, culminating mm -hmm. in uh, legislation that has passed out of the House Judiciary Committee uh, that is full legalization, uh, the MORE Act. So we've got um, lots of pieces. Let's, let's pause together. there. Let's pause there a second. Um, yeah. uh, Corey, um, uh, on the on the safe banking, right? Obviously, the House is 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 hugely supportive. Um, yeah. How's it going in the Senate? Yeah. Look, I mean, we, there is tremendous support in the Senate, and if we had a vote on it, could get a vote on it, uh, it would pass uh, with more than sixty votes in support. The challenge is that the Senate Banking Committee uh, is, uh, yeah, yeah, that is not a very helpful uh, committee for legislation to go through that is related to cannabis. So we have some of the most staunch uh, um, opposition uh, to uh, cannabis reforms in the Senate on that committee. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we've been working closely with uh, Senator Crapo, the chairman. He's been very good uh, to try to find it because he, he knows the problem. I mean, look, you got billions of dollars that are on the outside of the economy looking in. We need them on the inside of the economy looking out. And at a time like right now, when we have billions of dollars that's leaving banks, the banking system to help save our economy, this is a chance for us to bring billions of dollars into the economy, into the banks. And so it just makes sense to get this done. And I believe the chairman of the banking committee, Mike Crapo, recognizes that. So he's got some different ideas of how to do it. And so Senator Merkley and I have I had a long conversations with him many, many times about how to move forward. Uh, I, I commend the House for passing it. I hope that we can pass it. It ought to be included in our next relief package. Because again, if we're putting billions of dollars out into the economy to save businesses, let's let money come back into those same banks so that that too can be distributed to help save our economy right now and get people back to work. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of support. We just have to get it through this, uh, this, uh, this package and get it into a package and get it out of the banking committee and into law. I've talked to the president about this. He understands the need for it. In fact, he said, hey, look, some of the opposition to, uh, to, to cannabis sounds like something my granddad said in the 1950s. Uh, and, uh, you know, apparently they're all on the Senate Banking Committee now. So we have to make sure that we, uh, that we get through that and get this done. I think it's got tremendous support. Uh, and, and we just, we have to find that moment. To, and we're, I think we found it with the House's work uh, to get it done. No, I mean, um you know, last week was with McConnell and, and others were complaining about including this in the, um, in the, in the, the relief effort. Um, and, you know, it's just hard to, it's hard to think about how that's going to happen. I mean, how, 
know, we're going to get some, I mean, it's just like, it would be so powerful to be able to get something soon to be able yeah. to push this through. And I feel like we've got two big things right now that have changed it, right? I mean, obviously what's happened in the last week with these places getting robbed, I mean, they're getting robbed because there's yeah. cash there, right? right? I mean, this is the, this is, yeah. that's, that's on the hands of people who haven't voted for this, you know? It's, it, it's this and headless hand problem. Oh, sorry, Earl, go ahead. Go ahead Earl. I'm just going to say it's, it's teed up. I mean, our leadership got some blowback from Republicans in the House and others, but they understood that this ought to be part of the package going forward. So that's what we sent over to the Senate. Uh, and it's, uh, we've watched uh, Mitch McConnell uh, start out on a number of these things being opposed to helping state and local governments, for instance. Well, over time, uh, he's modified his position. I think this is something that is relatively easy for him to do because as Corey says, there's a majority in the Senate, over 60 votes, that would vote for it in a heartbeat. And the critical nature of cannabis, you know, how all these states declared it an essential service. Yes. And these are red states and blue states. And the uh, $12 billion of revenue that it comes to state and local governments because of cannabis is looming larger. This is even more important when they're losing revenue. So I think, Troy, we're in a position we can move forward. Uh, I commend. Uh, Corey, for staying at it in the Senate and working with my friend and colleague, uh, Senator Merkley. But I, I think this is something that is entirely possible and the elements are lined up uh, ever stronger than ever. Absolutely. Troy, if you, if you don't mind, I'll jump in on that because, yeah. uh, you know, I remember a conversation I had with uh, Senator McConnell. Uh, it was during the, the tax debates and I was talking about uh, the 280E issue and what we needed to do to address that. Uh, and uh, I'm in the well of the Senate, Senator McConnell's right there. And I turn to him and I say, you know, things, are, things have changed. Even the state of Utah is going to legalize medical marijuana. And, and you know, Mitch looks at me and says, even Utah? And so right then, Orrin Hatch from Utah, a senator from Utah, walks up. And Mitch turns to Orrin and says, Orrin, is Utah really going to legalize marijuana? And Orrin Hatch folds his hands, looks down at his feet and says, first tea, then coffee, and now this. I mean, things things have changed. So we're we're getting there, and we just need to make it happen. Yep, yep. Um, I um, uh, you know, this idea when 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 all this stuff with COVID and all this these huge these huge multi trillion dollar packages, and I think back to alcohol prohibition, and I think back to how you know, we ultimately you know part of what created the political will um, was needing to get out of the depression and needing that tax money. Um, curious to get both of your take on this. How does this, how does what's been happening with, with uh, COVID change um, this, the, the politics of this issue? I mean, it just strikes me on some level that people gotta be like, okay, can we just get this thing done? Because we got bigger, we got more important things to do. Right. Well, I think actually you started us off with some, somber and I think appropriate comments about what we're seeing on our streets and the unrest and the angst. But part of what's happened on our streets is a reflection of unequal application of the law. And nothing is a, a more graphic example of this than what's happened with how we have enforced an inequitable, unnecessary, illogical prohibition of cannabis. Uh, and I was serious what I said a moment ago, destroying a million African-American young men's lives. And I think the awareness that people see now about the inequity, and we're actually in the process of letting out of prisons non-violent offenders who are there for drug offenses, and in many cases may not have been uh, justified being there at all. I think there is a shift. The cannabis crisis is causing new thinking. It's putting new stress. It's highlighting inequities. But what we're seeing on the streets in terms of the protesters um, highlights another dimension here 
and that our work in the failed policy of prohibition uh, is a powerful signal of reconciliation. Well said, well said. Um, Corey, comments on that? Yeah, look, I think that's why this is so important. I mean, this is a recognition of, uh, you know, we passed the First Step Act, I think, uh, uh, you know, in the House and the Senate to start making some of these reforms and this, uh, uh, this un unequal application of the law uh, that uh, Earl has talked about. We can start addressing that with so many of the measures that we're dealing with here, uh, as we have with the First Step Act, the you know, broader piece of uh, judicial reform. And so I think that's what we, we have to concentrate on. I think Earl's exactly right. Look, I mean, uh, the murder of George, George Floyd has, you know, seared our souls and uh, the, the protesters' voices that need to be heard, but not just heard, acted upon, um, you know, there's a lot of pieces to that. This may be a very, you know, a small piece in the bigger picture of uh, our history, but it needs to get done. It is part of the solution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, changing gears a little bit, I'm just looking at some of the Q&As we've got here. Got a good question here. Um, uh, how quickly do you think banks will actually adopt cannabis programs once safe passes? Because um, it's an expensive process. And, you know, I, I remember being at an Arcview event when they first announced Treasury was announcing that, you know, there was going to be new rules around this. And we all thought we won, you know. And then it turns out, like, no, just because they created a path didn't mean that the banks were actually going to do it. And so um, do, do we really think that people, that the banks will take, will, will actually do it once this has happened? And how is that part of the thinking? Yeah, go ahead, Earl. Yeah. Well, I, I think it's going to happen very quickly. I mean, look at what the support we were able to line up for our Safe Banking Act. I mean, it wasn't just the advocates and people in the industry although they played a critical role. And, and Troy, you've been a part of that, watching the increasing sophistication of the industry and the advocates being able to, in, in a very passionate way, make compelling cases. But we had the credit unions. We had the American Banking Association. There are a wide array of professional groups and organizations that joined us. And the $12 billion uh, is the tip of the iceberg. I mean, there is a huge marijuana industry in the United States that we want to drag out of the shadows. We want to stop the black market. We want to make it legal. We want to make it safe. Um, and I think there is uh, forces aligned that once the, you know, the, we break uh, the log jam, I think these things are going to happen very quickly. You are on the, you in the industry, uh, I can't say enough for uh, the marijuana policy project. Um, what's, uh, what's happened with the Cannabis Business Association. Uh, people are, are, are ready to go and move this. And I think they've laid the foundation and I anticipate we're going to see very rapid progress. Yeah, yeah. yeah and I agree. And I think, I, you know, when you ask how quickly they'll adopt it, my answer is yesterday. Uh, they want this done as quickly as possible. Now, I've heard from some, some of the big national banks, the big, big banks, that if the Safe Banking Act passes and you don't have a bill like the States Act pass or something else, then maybe they won't get into it. Mm -hmm. There are gonna be so many banks that do get into this, so many credit unions that do get into it, they will be left in the dust. And so, uh, you know, I mean, maybe, maybe the big, big, big guys don't get in. Uh, just like the Paycheck Protection Program though, the smaller banks are gonna be carrying uh, uh, the load as well and they'll start, they'll start uh, getting this done. Yep, yep. Um, and on this, uh, to go back a little bit to the, the safe banking um, stuff, since that's sort of the thing right now that I think is like, we feel like we're close on. Um, and Senator Crapo, as you mentioned earlier, is like really the, is, is kind of the linchpin here um, in being able to get this, get this heard. Um, you have his ear. What's, what's, what's happened in there? Yeah, look, to, to Senator Crapo's credit, he has been very open to the conversation on uh, the Safe Banking Act. Not just open, but actively fighting for a solution, trying to find a, a way that, that he could get support on his committee from both Democrats and Republicans. Uh, you know, he comes from a state that, you know, you have red states, you have blue states. He comes from a ruby state, a ruby red state. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, he's got to figure out how to do this in a way that uh, helps people understand the need to do this from a public policy perspective. 
Uh, mm -hmm. so, so in the conversation Senator Merkley and I have had with him, uh, we've had good talks about what he wants from a safety uh, perspective. You know, is he worried about some kind of public safety studies? Yes, absolutely. Let's, let's do that. Let's get that information out there. Uh, you know, he's come up with some other ideas that he knows aren't going to be as supportive. He talks about some content regulation. Well, you know what? I think industry's made it very clear that that's something that's not going to have support and it won't have that coalition necessary to pass. So I think he understands that. Uh, and so, so he's been very open to it. And he's also open to the conversation about, can we put it into something uh, like another bill that moves? Uh, and so we're going to continue that conversation. And, uh, and because he, look, I think there are a lot of my colleagues. I, I don't know. I mean, they come from states that, that don't have what Colorado, Oregon, uh, California experienced earlier on in this than anybody else. Uh, and so they didn't know what to expect. They really didn't have a familiarity with it. Uh, but all of a sudden, uh, business professionals are coming into their office talking about the you know 70 plus thousand people in Colorado that work in the industry, 70,000 good right. paying jobs, you know, a $2 billion a year cash economy. That's not good to have a $2 billion cash economy. Let's get it out of the shadow into the sunlight. Uh, the fact that you have banks coming in, you know, the you know, Bank of Main Street USA coming in saying, hey, we'd like to do this. It's a coalition that has made a big difference. And as Earl said, credit to all of you for making that difference. And now we just have to get it across the line. Yeah. Try, let me just say, I, I'm excited about the prospects uh, of the Safe Banking Act, and I'm proud that we put it in the package. But there are a number of other things that are teed up yeah. and ready to go. I have been campaigning on this issue from Bangor, Maine to Santa Barbara for years. I worked on the ground in, with campaigns when there, you know, frankly, weren't many politicians who were around. That has changed. Yeah. yeah. Red Good states point. and blue states, we see now for the first time a majority of Republicans support full legalization. And in the House, we oh, have. Did I lose everybody or just Earl? We have no, other pieces of legislation uh, that are ready to go. We have a research bill, a bipartisan research bill that would help uh, solve some of these unnecessary lingering problems. We have support uh, for uh, the uh, uh, legislation uh, that I've had for veterans access to medical marijuana, overwhelmingly supported uh, in the House. Um, these are things that can pass both the House and the Senate that will help move forward an, a, an agenda that I think will culminate in our potentially being able to legal it this Congress, or certainly the next. Uh, and, yes. and, and look at, at what Chairman Nadler has done with the Moore Act, right. uh, which is a superb piece of legislation, full legalization. And he put two of his key people on this to be able to move it. And it's passed out of committee with bipartisan support ready to vote. So there's a lot up there that, uh, at, le at least in the House, that's yeah. teed up, ready to go. And some of your friends are active at the state level because we're not done at the state level either. This right. is the year. Yeah, we'll talk about that um, in the next segment too, some of the what's happening at the state level. But um, yeah, I really think that, I agree with you, Earl, that, that we need to think about this. This is a whole new day and this issue's got incredible public support. So, you know, there's these little things we can do like banking and everything else, but I think we need to have our eyes on the prize for sure. But before we get to the prize though, there's a big election coming up in November. Um, and I'm curious to get both of your, your takes, not just at the presidential level and, and what the dynamics of this issue might take in the, uh, in the, in the election, um, but also uh, Senator Gardner, you're in a, in a tough race um, for, uh, for your seat versus uh, former Governor um, Hickenlooper. Um, and um, so curious, um, Let's start off, actually, I'd love to get each of your perspectives on the, the, the presidential race and what could, how this might play out. You know, you've got Biden, who's kind of like not so favorable, but is kind of getting moved around. He sees the politics. But, um, and then you've got uh, Trump, who's been pro states' rights, but pretty against uh, legalization. It seems like it's jump ball right now with this issue. Would you agree? Yeah, well, look, I'll, I'll just start in there. When I first, did, I think it was the day that I had a meeting at the White House on trade issues and tariffs. Uh, it also happened to be, a, a, I think, the same day that Jeff Sessions had made the announcement on the Coleman Memorandum. 
So after we do our meeting on uh, the, the trade and, and tariff issues, I think Senator Sullivan, Senator Blunt, uh, uh, Senator Ernst, I think they were all in the room uh, when we had the, the tariff meeting. And after it was over, I said, hey, you know, Mr. President, I want to talk to you about what Jeff Sessions just did. And his response, was, that's when he said, oh, yeah, it sounded like something that my great, great uh, my grandfather did in the 1950s. Because he recognized that the states had moved beyond what, what the then Attorney General Jeff Sessions had done. And so I think he recognized the policy was wrong and that you just, you can't go back. And he didn't want to go back. He, whether he agreed or disagreed, you know, that's a, a conversation that, that he's had on television uh, interviews for uh, any number of years. But he recognized that you're just not, we're not going to change things. You're not going back. And he also recognizes states' rights. And so that's why he said, I support your bill, the States Act. So, uh, you know, I think he's there on that. And they, they ought to be more forth, uh, forthright about it and make it, look, it's a 70%, 80% issue. Yeah. <laughs> not yeah. among Democrats, against Democrats and Republicans. Yeah. So this is a, this is a smart issue. Uh, good, good policy is good politics, as they say. Yeah, it just seems like the kind of thing where he could, e you know, easily outflank um, Biden on the issue um, if he if he made it made it an issue. Um, Earl, go ahead. Well, there will never be a president elected who is anti-cannabis. I'll just say that flat out. Yeah, we've turned that corner. You know, I spent a lot of time uh, with Team Clinton in 2016. I mean, I went to the mothership in, in uh, Brooklyn. I talked about uh, the implications for policy, for politics, for fundraising. Um, I'll go to my gray, and, and actually she, I had two meetings with her, and I know she heard it because she, she transcribed notes of our conversation that ended up in some of the leaked wiki documents. Uh, so I know that it was delivered, but just they never acted on it. And I'll go to my grave convinced that if she could have had a coherent, positive statement on cannabis, she yeah. wouldn't have had to worry about 78,000 votes in Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan. And how are we going to make sure that doesn't happen again this time? Well, we're doing it. And, and you and the folks out there making this a serious political issue. I've had conversations with Team Biden. I've given them the uh, survey research I talked about the politics and talked about the merits. And in fact, what's blowing up now on the streets makes it even more compelling to have a reform position dealing with cannabis. But up and down the, the, the ticket, I mean, I have worked very hard to make this a political issue. Uh, I do everything in Congress on a bipartisan basis, uh, but I'm not working to get more Republicans elected. Uh, but no, I, I was involved- I was involved with almost uh, 90 congressional campaigns in the last cycle. Nobody got money from me or support if they didn't get my memo about why this was important. And I went out, particularly against some of the people who were our enemies. Uh, yeah. A number of us, uh, you helped us uh, retire Pete Session, who is a former <laughs> member of Congress now. Yeah. because he was our number one enemy uh, on the Rules Committee in the last Congress. And we had a terrific guy, Colin Allred, who won in a district because he was on the right side of this issue. Yeah. This is a potent political issue. And I'm going to continue, particularly at the congressional level, where I think this makes a difference in the House and the Senate. This needs to be front and center because it is something that can bring Americans together on a bipartisan basis, but I'm going to work to make sure that we get a majority uh, that will be able to deliver on this even more strongly than we've done in the past. Yes, and thank you so much for all the work that you're doing, Earl, on, on this way beyond out of your own district, but just in general, you know, being able to, to, to make sure that the, all the political work that you're doing to support this issue um, uh, with, with elections and stuff. It's, it's really tremendous. Thank you. Um, and um, Corey, um, we got to wrap this up pretty quick, but I do want to give you a chance to just uh, contrast, you know, you're in, a, you're in this tough race. You got both you and, and um, Hickenlooper, uh, from what I understand, opposed uh, 64 at the beginning. You both changed your minds. You both are supportive of the law now. Um, what, how, aside from that, what, how would you contrast yourself uh, with, with him on this, on this topic? 
Yeah, well, a couple things. You know, building on what Earl talked about in terms of bipartisanship, I think it's really important that the issue of cannabis not be uh, put into a partisan corner. I think that is bad for the industry, bad for future policies if it is put into a partisan corner. Let me give you an example from a 2018 race. Uh, there was a, a, a member of Congress who was a Republican, a very strong supporter of renewable energy, uh, and would buck his conference on renewable energy, would lead legislation on renewable energy, would do everything he could to try to convince people, not to Republicans, not to let the hair on the back of their necks uh, bristle when somebody said renewable energy. And he went back to his state that probably was more aligned with the opposition to renewable energy than they were in favor of. And so he was willing to take a stand and go out and fight for it, even though he caught a lot of heat on the Republican side for taking that position. The, the renewable energy industry then turned around and sat it out and didn't help his, him at all in the race. They said, well, you know, we're going to help the Democrat or we think the Democrat is, uh, is going to win or maybe they just decided they like the Democrat. This member lost. He came back. He came back because, you know, we have lame duck sessions. He came back and he said, you know what? There were people who I fought for who didn't have my back. And so the next time you go out and fight for people that don't have your back, think twice because maybe they're going to be gone when you turn around and work. And so the message that it sent to uh, some of his colleagues who were, you know, maybe had the same kind of state as he did was, gosh, you know, why would I follow him? Because there was nobody there to help. So I'd get in trouble back home. I'd lose my rent. What good does it do? So that's the danger of having it become a partisan issue. You know, uh, you know, there's still a primary on the Democratic side. I don't know who it's going to be. Uh, John Hickenlooper, right before he announced for president, said that he would recriminalize, consider recriminalizing re uh, marijuana. You know, he vetoed the three marijuana related bills in, in, in the Senate or in, 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 uh, in Colorado. You know, one of the reasons why you asked early on, one of the reasons why I got involved in this issue, uh, I remember meeting with, with Paige Feeden about our medical CBD, uh, our CBD bill. And it was about Paige and, and, and we're just heartbroken that Paige has passed away. But that's the reason I got on that bill and introduced it in the House of Representatives years and years ago, was that moment. When John Hickenlooper had a chance to do more for medical marijuana, he vetoed it. So I think that's a pretty big difference. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, I really appreciate both of you coming on and spending your time together uh, with us today. Um, and um, you know, we're behind you. We're back in. We're back in your efforts um, to pass these laws in your various uh, chambers. Um, as soon as we get done here, we're going to be talking with Steve Hawkins of MPP and Aaron Smith of NCIA and about about how do we help you guys pass this legislation. Um, so it's. It's great to be in partnership. It's great to be in bipartisanship on this. Um, I feel like sometimes cannabis is kind of the only thing bringing people together these days. Um, and uh, let's pass some reform this year. Let's do it. Thank you both. Okay. And so with that, um, let's bring um, Aaron Smith, um, who is the uh, CEO of the National Cannabis Industry Association, and uh, Steve Hawkins, who is the executive director of the Marijuana Policy Project. Uh, let's bring them uh, to, I like, I like to call, the stage. I've just done this live so many times that I can't not say stage, even though we're on a webinar. <laughs> um, Aaron, Steve, welcome. Hey, Troy, great to be here. Troy, great to have you. Thanks. Yes, great to have you both. Um, so um, first reactions from that conversation, what, what stands out to you? You know, it struck out, what, what stuck out to me, Troy, was uh, Orrin Hatch uh, commenting <laughs> to uh, Leader McConnell about Utah. And it reminds yeah. me that MPP uh, did you know started off as a ballot initiative, ended up settling with the governor and the Mormon Church and the legislature there to get medical cannabis in, and it's and it just goes to show how the interplay of what happens at the state level uh, influences and has an impact in Congress. Yeah, yeah, really well well said, 
Uh, absolutely. How about for you, Aaron? Anything particular? Well, yeah, I got to say, you know, I love Senator Gardner's impression of uh, Mitch McConnell there. That uh, that was uh, pretty <laughs> pretty amusing. Uh, but seriously, though, you know, I I think uh, just just hearing from these two these two congressional leaders uh, also just really demonstrates that this is a a nonpartisan, it's a transpartisan issue, really, and that you know what you might come at at this issue from from different angles. Um, but you know, I think the the two most you know salient reasons to uh, regulate marijuana right now are uh, primarily the the uh, the racial uh, injustices that are happening, you know, in, with in disparities with arrests, uh, and also the economic uh, the potential for economic uh, vitality through uh, job creation and tax revenue uh, that the industry uh, creates. And those are two issues that are front and center for uh, everybody in this country right now. So I, I'm. I'm hopeful that uh, that we will see uh, some reform uh, sooner rather than later. Yeah, can you can you double click on that, Aaron, a little bit about federal reform sooner rather than later? I mean, we've been waiting a long time, um, and this issue is incredibly popular. Um, what what's going on? Yeah, I mean, we sure have. I mean, we've been you know working at this as a, as a kind of an incremental approach to. Uh, to, to you know, reform through through the years, pre you know, before NCIA, of course, MPP has done great work, and Normal and others, uh, for you know, this movement's been going on for for decades and decades. Um, but you know, con Congress specifically, you know, I think I think there's there's two two big pressure points. One is which I know that Steve is, is going to talk about more is getting you know, more states on board because that that flips the switch for a lot of uh, elected officials like Senator Gardner who opposed reform, but now is one of the champions and, and uh, uh, but, but also, you know, it also allows members of Congress and other elected officials to just see that this works and voters, which at the end of the day, uh, it's about constituents. And, um, you know, I think as, as Senator Gardner no, uh, noted, you know, something like the Safe Banking Act does have support in the Senate, but you have very, very conservative, older um, uh, members of the Senate that are, that are in very powerful positions, chairmanships are very powerful positions and can hold up everything. Not to mention that our, our federal system actually is designed to make it very difficult to pass uh, any legislation. Uh, but I think that, you know, the progress has been happening incrementally and I think it's going to start happening exponentially. And, and you know, when we see just, you know, for all of these years, it was only last year that we started seeing actual bills pass out of committee and onto the house floor. And, uh, you know, I think that, you know, the time is right to, uh, if not this year, certainly next, but I hope that we can see some uh, reform, at least around the banking issue uh, this, this year. And, um, and Aaron, what, uh, can you share a little bit about how NCIA works um, to push those things forward? Um, and um, kind of just, just because a lot of people out there, they just hear NCIA, they don't, they don't really know what, what goes on behind the scenes and, and, and how we move, who we represent and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, NCI is a traditional trade association. Every industry in this country has uh, trade associations that uh, help to uh, educate the industry, uh, create uh, networking opportunities for the industry. And those are, I think, kind of what people see front and center. But most importantly, what NCI is doing is uh, also advocating for that industry uh, at the federal level and lobbying uh, members of Congress, educating them on these issues and uh, making them feel comfortable moving along the kind of spectrum from you know, op opponent to kind of middle of the road to supporter to a champion. And uh, that takes, you know, that takes a lot of sit down meetings and phone calls and emails. Uh, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of lobbyists working on a myriad of issues in DC. And at any, you know, at any given time, a member of Congress is, is looking at uh, dozens of pieces of legislation. And it's really important that uh, groups like ours are there to make sure that the industry has a seat at the table uh, and that's what NCIA is doing for, for the cannabis industry. Great, and, and, and how many members um, does NCIA have and what does it cost to be a member? Uh, we're, we're pushing just, uh, just under 2,000 members and uh, the membership range is from 1,000 a year to 5,000 a year, depending on the level of involvement. And uh, all of that uh, work goes back, all, all of those uh, dues revenue go back into our work to advocate for and support the cannabis industry. Great. Yeah. So if you're listening out there and you are, you know, spending significant resources in the cannabis sector um, as an investor or as a company, um, making sure that um, 
you and or your companies you're investing in our members of NCIA is super, super important because um, we are not there yet. Um, so yeah, thanks Aaron for that work. Um, Steve, so um, give us a, a sense as to what's happening at the state level right now. Um, and, and also perhaps to share a little bit more about the, the thesis um, between how passing a state imp impacts federally um, and, and that whole idea. Sure, I, you know, we are at this point now where the SAFE Act is being debated in Congress and, and other measures because we've gotten to the point where we have 33 states having passed medical and 11 states having adult use. Uh, and it, 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 it becomes a matter of math, right? You begin to win over senators and members of Congress as well as the fact that the states are laboratories of democracy, right? And as the states change their view, um, it, it, um, it, it makes the ice thicker for Congress to walk out on. <laughs> well said, I like that. I like that analogy. So a lot is happening at the state level. This fall, we will see four ballot initiatives uh, that all should, should, should win. Montana, which had uh, stop be because of the stay at home order, but is now back online. The signature drive is going great. South Dakota, which will be the first of its kind where there will be both a question to legalize for medical and a, and a question to legalize for adult use. And that's because Troy, we've just gotten to the point where there's just that level of acceptability. And then Arizona it is looking great. And of course, New Jersey, the legislature has asked for for the plebiscite. So we expect all four of those to pass. Then in 21, we're looking at New York, we're looking at Connecticut, uh, Maryland, Rhode Island, New these Mexico. Are, these are legislative. Let's make a distinction. Yes, those are all gonna be yeah. led legislative efforts. But what will be different, and this, you know, uh, came out in the discussion with Senator Gardner and, um, and, uh, and uh, Blumenhauer was that uh, we are now going into these discussions under the, uh, under the pandemic response and thinking about economic recovery. So yeah. every, every state is going to be desperate for, to make up its revenue deficits in any way possible. Uh, every state is going to be looking for job creation. Mm -hmm. uh, and every state is going to be looking for opportunities to revitalize Main Street. And while that has all been part of the discussion before in terms of trying to get states to, to legalize, uh, it will have a heightened resonance now. So I'm, I'm feeling good that we could see, you know, these four states in the fall and another five or six states in the spring through, through legislation legalized cannabis. And Troy, frankly, at that point, if we have the 11 states now that have legalized for full adult use and another nine join them, I think at that point, we're way beyond the discussion of the SAFE Act, and, and um, we're, we have rounded the bases at that point towards uh, descheduling cannabis and ending federal prohibition. Absolutely. The, um, you know, this interesting thing about, about using this for uh, COVID relief and the tax money, you know, I mean, the federal government, right? Couldn't the federal government do a, do a tax, an excise tax, uh, as well, um, or would that be need? You need to have full federal legalization, not just states' rights legalization, uh, for that. Um, and then also, it just occurs to me, you know, the federal government can print money, whereas a state really can't. So the state, like, really actually has to, you know, figure out their finances in a way that the federal government just doesn't. Um, but curious on both of you, this topic of um, taxes and COVID relief between the federal and the state level. Yeah, so, you know, I think, um, I, I guess it would probably be technically feasible to tax cannabis without descheduling it, but that's not something that I think any of us would advocate for. Um, you know, what, end of the day, what we need to do is deschedule cannabis, regulate it uh, at the, you know, at the state and federal level. Um, and, and I think that uh, the excise tax is a component in that, in that plan, uh, federal excise tax. And our uh, policy council at NCIA has put out uh, some publications and recommendations for doing that. And we're actually working on updating those recommendations uh, now. 
Um, the, you know, on the COVID side, and this is something that we're kind of hyper-focused on almost myopically right now in the current climate is uh, one, uh, trying to get some, uh, some, you know, some form of the Safe Banking Act into the COVID relief bill, which, which as was mentioned earlier, is in the House version. Uh, uh, McConnell, unfortunately, kind of, you know, took to the House floor and, and opposed uh, much of that, but, um, you know, he's, he has moved on some of these things in the past. Uh, and then secondly, um, trying to uh, allow the industry to access the uh, Small Business Administration uh, loans and the relief programs, because, um, you know, this industry, while we have had to comply with, you know, an enormous, you know, amount of regulations at the state level, uh, and all of the uh, requirements that are put in place as, a, as an essential industry um, open and, you know, we've have employees taking the risk out there um, uh, in, in following all the social distancing requirements and the other health requirements that are put in place for essential businesses through this pandemic. Um, at the end of the day, there's no, no access to the federal uh, lending programs or the disaster relief programs uh, because of the federal status. So those are two, you know, I think really important incremental changes that everybody here should be, you know, calling a member of Congress and talking about this um, in, the, in the immediate term. Uh, and then going into the long term, I absolutely agree with, with uh, Stephen that we've, we've gone beyond the, uh, you know, these sort of incremental changes and we need to really start looking at descheduling and regulating cannabis in a, in a way that's, that's sensible for such a, for a relatively safer product. Absolutely. Um, and um, uh, one of the topics that comes up, I'm sure, at NCAA a lot, but I know it comes up a lot at MPP um, with all these different states, and it's really relevant to our audience, is, is the competitive landscape in each of those states, right? Um, you know, is this really creating a lot of opportunity um, when you've got, you know, one or two companies that is able to own all of the, all of the licenses um, in states. And then you have the, the, the other side where you've got states that have just allowed it everywhere and that can hurt it politically and, and, and things like that. So it's curious to just um, to share a little bit about what the opportunities look like in the different states and how you think about that at MPP. Yeah, I, I think, Troy, that again the states will continue to vary you know some states will give out more limited licenses some will uh create tiers uh i you know i i think in terms of equity provisions that illinois and what it's done may be a model for for some states in, in the future it's it's really hard to tell i i think where where we um can have impact is to make sure that uh, we begin to build more of a cadre of legislators around the country who are connected to one another, talk with one another, get a sense of best practices. Um, that kind of college of, of uh, supporters is still, I think, nascent for, for, for the industry. Uh, and on the same token or in the same vein, Legis uh, regulators to uh, you know sort of encouraging best practices. Uh, I'm encouraged by the kind of conversations going on at MPP and then certainly uh, NCIA as I'm well with the Policy Council there. How how we begin to shape what the future of the regulation and what the policy will look like because in the final analysis. Uh, winning and, and getting cannabis legalized for adult and medical use, it's only half the battle. The other half then comes with how, with, with, with how the programs will unfold, whether they'll actually be efficient, whether industry will be able to flourish, well, the, whether consumers will be able to get prop product. And that's, that's where we're seeing um, mixed results, I think, around the country. Yeah. Um, and um, uh, last little uh, question here. It's a little little off the beaten path a little bit, but um, but I think very relevant to the times that are that are happening here. You know, um, Steve, you you know, used to be at the NAACP um, at the Coalition and the Death Penalty um, at Amnesty International, right? So, uh, right at the centerpiece of all of the things that sort of can touch on a lot of what's happening right now um, between you know policing and criminal justice and race. And I um, was curious to get your take. I know we've hit a couple of the issues throughout the conversation here already, but 
um, as it relates to cannabis uh, and, and some of the work that we're all that we're doing. Um, uh, if you might be able to comment on on the current situation in that light. Sure, I you know, and, and I've been working on justice reform issues and policy work for 30 years, Troy, and I've seen so many cases uh, like Mr. Floyd's o over the years. Here is, here is the commonality, and that is that cannabis has been at the epicenter of the war on drugs. It's been at the epicenter, at the heart of American policing in communities targeted for the war on drugs. And we've just seen that time and time again. Uh, it plays out in terms of uh, who gets stopped. Um, so when we look at Philando Castile, who was killed in Minnesota some years back, he was stopped and uh, the cop and the police officer responded to the smell of marijuana in the car. You have Trayvon Martin uh, and with his death, uh, Zimmerman is allowed to argue in court that Trayvon had, was under the influence of cannabis and Troy, he had, the, the level of THC in this kid's system showed that he had smoked a joint like two weeks er earlier. So, you know, the civil rights lawyer and the former NAACP official in me has seen this time and time again. It's part of the reason why I'm, I, I am at M MPP because as we end the prohibition on cannabis and legalize it, that will give the full measure of protection that people will, uh, will, uh, will uh, need. Uh, decriminalization is insufficient for, for that. Orlando Castile gets killed in Minnesota, which decriminalized in the late 70s. So um, we, we, we need to have this in place to, I think at the end of the day, begin to fundamentally change American policing. So, you know, I encourage the investors listening to think about supporting M M MPP as, as, as we do this work and uh, apologies for the shameless plug. <laughs> no, there's no, no shameless plug there. Okay. This is super, super important work. Um, and um, yes, I highly encourage it, especially um, if we can pass some more state laws, um, the resources are gonna be super important uh, uh, to do that. And also to make those laws as fair as possible, right? Um, because there are other players at the table. Right, so let's get money behind people who really want to make it as fair as possible. Um, awesome. Thank you both, um, Aaron, Steve. Um, of course, I get to work with you guys all the time. I'm on, on board of both of your uh, organizations, and um, I miss you guys at the Arcview meetings. Though you know, it's not it's not quite the same. But I'm really glad to have you on Zoom and um, keep up the great work. Thank you. Thank you, Troy. All right. Thanks. Um, well, next up, and you can go to um, mpp.org, and you can also go to, um, I think it's the cannabisindustry.org um, for NCIA. Um, and if you're not a member, become one. If you haven't donated to uh, uh, the state work, um, uh, please consider doing so. Um, I'm really excited to bring our next guests on, um, Alan Bankier and Gene Sullivan. Um, to talk about how this all impacts investment. You know, um, part of the name of the game is figuring that out. Welcome, Gene. Welcome, Alan. Thank you, Troy. Yes. Thanks, um, Troy. So, um, so a little background. So Alan Bankier um, uh, is like, he's an investor's investor. You know, I mean, he invests has been investing in early stage companies for a long time. Um, it's been, you know, part of the New York Angels, has been real involved at Arcview for a long time, has invested in a number of companies um, that have come through our ecosystem. He serves on boards um, and really um, has, you know, how, how long have you been investing in this space, Alan? Uh, since about 2013. Okay, and so- not as long as you. Right. <laughs> You forgot the best part and a number of successful exits that he helped create. Yes. Somebody like that. You guys are too kind. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome, welcome, Alan. And then of course, Dean um, uh, almost needs no introduction. I mean, in addition to being a phenomenal investor, look at how great she is at growing cannabis. Look at that. Can you right believe here it? in my living room no. in New York City. <laughs> <laughs> I have to come over uh, there, Dean. <laughs> 
So a um, little background on Gene. Gene is, is a you know, classically trained VC, uh, one of the first female VCs at a, a, a decent sized firm to be investing in the tech space um, years ago and has been involved in investing in the cannabis sector for, for quite some time uh, and uh, helps out with a lot of uh, female oriented um, investment groups uh, as well and um, is uh, heading up our um, uh, ArcView um, Collective Fund and ArcView Ventures um, with our colleague Jeff Finkel um, and so has been really steeped in the cannabis sector. Welcome, Jean. Thank you so much. It's All right. Certainly, so, I, will, I have to tell you though, Troy, not only being part of ArcView, learning from you, learning from incredible business owners and entrepreneurs and other investors, it was the war on drugs that got me into this business when I learned it was a war on research, a war on people, a war on science, and that got me over, but certainly the economic opportunity. I saw that within about five more seconds. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, the whole thought behind ArcView is if we can create a profitable, um, politically engaged and credible cannabis sector that will will be able to change the change the laws and you know we're we're moving you know towards that um, now um, so let's dig in what thoughts on you know if 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 federal legalization happens next year versus say five years from now how does that impact your investment? Ask, how does that how does that impact what companies you invest in and and the trajectory that they're going to take? So uh, I'll I'll jump in first. Yeah. I want to thank you, Troy. And, and, <clears throat> excuse me, Arcview and Kim uh, for inviting me to the stage, and I'm honored to be on this stage with mm -hmm. Senator Gardner, Representative Blutenauer, and Steve and Aaron. And I'm I'm, I'm like. I'm really happy that Gene and you are here so I can feel a little bit more comfortable in my little screen because <laughs> it's pretty amazing. And I want to send a big shout out to all the uh, ArcView community and uh, all the friends that I've made at ArcView. I mean, and I'm, I'm, I mean, real friends, not just people that I know through business purposes, but people that I've been in touch during this whole COVID uh, confinement thing. And I miss you all and I look forward to seeing you soon. So in terms of, um, you know, I'm going to step back just a little bit because what COVID-19 did is accelerate a whole trend. And within the cannabis industry, it accelerated three trends. Weak companies, companies that were just kind of like struggling and were already capital starved are in worse shape. Strong companies that were executing and that have strong balance sheets and have been doing what they should be doing are getting stronger. And we discovered that cannabis, which we all know, is an essential business. And all the states realize that. Hopefully the federal government will realize it. And that is accelerating the whole trend that I see towards not only state, but hopefully federal legalization. Now to get to the specific question, you know, I, I think state legalization is going to be very, very complex. And I think that, uh, like I think Steve was saying, it's going to be much more at a, at, a, at a state level. So from my perspective of investing in, in companies, and I invest primarily in, in private companies. I'm an investor in about 21 now, and I'm on the board or an advisor of eight. And it's just a grueling fight every day. You know, it's, it's, it's a business and, a, and it's a complex business. And so whether legalization is going to happen in a year or in five years, I look at it much more with the states and hope that the companies that I'm investing in become cash flow positive and financially strong so that when we do get that legalization, whether it's in a year, whether it's in five years, it'll be like rocket fuel. You'll have institutional money coming in. You'll have big corporates coming in. And it's going to change the whole, the whole paradigm of the industry. But you have to survive and you have to thrive to get to that day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I imagine that on some level, there's, there's a, there's a um, debate. And I know we have this, this at ArcView. It's like the build or buy question, right? Is this, is this the kind of thing that when 
when the big dogs come in, um, is the company I'm investing in going to be big enough that they'll want to get purchased um, or small enough that they'll that they'll be they'll just be walked all over um, or is there some kind of moat around these businesses that actually makes it so that when this thing happens and the timing really matters whether that lifts everything up gene you want to share a little bit about that perspective There's no doubt it's darwinian the best of breed companies what dynamic leaders will be the ones because it will be, they will be acquired. This consolidation has been happening over the years, but it will absolutely accelerate. And see, my proxy for this is the tech industry. Because when the big dogs came in, entrepreneurism didn't go away, it thrived. And it will continue to thrive. And so here's where the action is, in my view, and I know Alan feels this way too. Let's put our eyes, and my eyes are on the East Coast. You see, those West Coast states, if you look, everyone knows California is 39 million people, but if you combine all those states, it's about 53 million people. If you look at the East Coast and a coalition of those states, it's about 54 million people. So a huge amount of people. And so we are legislatively bound, as you heard from Steve, we don't have ballot initiatives except a state like the Commonwealth of Massachusetts figured that out. So if the East Coast can learn from all the beautiful brands and products of Colorado and the Western states and now bring those beautiful brands or create those, because guess what we have on the East Coast, certainly in the New York metropolitan area. We have the intellectual capital and we have the capital. So we can hardly wait here to make that happen. That's where a lot of that investing action, wealth creation, wellness creation is ahead of us and here today. Mm -hmm. And what, what do you consider to be sort of the areas um, that will benefit the most and those that will benefit the least from these, these, kinds, of, uh, these kinds of changes? So Ellen, jump in, but here's my take. We follow the money flows. Even today, the money is still flowing into cultivation and retail. However, those who license holders and more to come, as you heard from the conversation uh, in the East Coast, as those licenses open up, those license holders need the operational efficiencies and all the businesses around that. We need testing. In New York, we have one state-run testing lab. This is craziness. How is that ever going to support multiple licenses in New York State, of which, just to remind everybody, there are only 10 vertical licenses in this state. Imagine we each have four dispensaries. Imagine if there are only 40 CVSs. So we, as the license holders in the New York area, as well as up and down the East Coast, we need the testing labs. We need genetics. We need to understand the efficacy, the marketing platforms. How about the professional services serving these areas? Love the whole world around uh, what's gonna happen with some of the great uh, bio uh, pharma kind of companies that can really attack some deep health issues. Uh, compliance, so needed to serve and to make sure that these uh, license holders are doing the right thing and all that. And so, so those are just some of the areas and there's, there's more where that came from. Yeah, and, and just, just to add to that, one of the things that we do need to keep in mind is that this is a now roughly $15 billion uh, legal, medical, and adult use market, but there is, based on whose estimate you want to take, a $50 billion uh, uh, illicit market. And legalization is great at the state level, at the federal level. But the real challenge, the real, real challenge is to convert that illicit market into a legal market and even chipping away. I mean, you know, you just, you just do the math, 15 billion. If you can just chip away five, 10 percent a year, that's tremendous growth. Yeah. And so the, the, the industries and the sectors that I look at and that I like most personally uh, are around branding and around science and around what Gene mentioned, compliance. And believe it or not, branding and science are, are really related because a brand is something that is consistent. First time, every time. 
the way we're going to have cannabis become consistent in whatever form you want is through science, is through uh, genetics, it's through superior breeding and processing and research that'll make, uh, uh, make it a true mature packaged goods. You know, if you turn this 50, 50 illicit, 15 legal, let's call it $65 billion industry, that is a huge industry. That is like bigger than uh, video games, uh, firearms, uh, um, and, and organic food all combined. So we're talking about a mega potential market. I know many, many of my friends out there, investors always like to talk about the total addressable market. This is a huge total addressable market. <laughs> so, um, you know, let's talk about, let's talk about brands and what happens under federal legalization, right? Um, you know, part of what is giving an opportunity to a lot of brands that they wouldn't otherwise have is that they're stuck in their various states. So, you know, you don't have to compete as much with a brand in the West Coast if you're on the East Coast or whatever, right? At the same time, it really limits their businesses, right? So on the one hand, you've got you know, as soon as we can go interstate and international and everything else, they have a bigger market, but they also get a lot more competition. Um, how do you make sense of, how do you make sense of that? You know, let me start with that because to me, this is one of the craziest parts of our business that Troy, you could create the most beautiful brand sitting there in Oakland and not be able to ship it to New York city. This right. is craziness. So our pretty interesting governor Cuomo has figured this out. Now, sure, New York's been slow to adopt adult use and as well as expansion of our medical program as shared earlier, we only have 10 vertical licenses. That's also craziness. But he has created through cannabis, a seven state coalition of all the surrounding states here. And he has a vision for interstate commerce. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying that's a lay down or easy or gonna happen overnight, but that's the idea that these states once empowered, have the ability to do business with each other. That's pretty exciting, don't you think? Yeah. And now the brands have an opportunity. Plus, let's bring some of those gorgeous brands that you all have in, in California and Colorado and the other adult use states. Let's get them to the East Coast. We have no flour, no edibles in New York City. Right. I like to say no nothing, but we do have the will, the creativity, the intellectual capital, and the money to make those things happen. It, it, it strikes me that there's a, that there's a um, uh, you know, an issue there because you do have these companies that are licensing, right? They're taking their right. product, they're licensing it out into, into a new state, right. which is a whole nother business, right? It's, it's just yeah. and hard. It's, it's the most and inefficient hard. thing in the world, right? right? It's terribly inefficient, but it's also where a lot of the opportunity lies, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, Alan, how do you make sense of it? So uh, I, I mentioned I'm, I'm an investor in 21 private companies, two brands, because I'm still struggling with this. I'm still yeah. struggling with it. And there's a whole other level is there's the brands, but then there's the stores, right? The, the, the stores. So like, you know, you can go, you can go to a store. I'm talking about in general, just any CPG, and you might go for your favorite brand. You can also go to a retail outlet or store because you like the stuff in that store. So, you know, there's going to be a natural competition that you find in all CPG between do you go to that, to that retail outlet because you trust that retail outlet as a brand or do you go to pick up the brand? And today I'm still struggling and I, I've got a pretty good CPG background from being in the food industry. I'm still struggling with how that's all going to work out because as I think I mentioned a couple minutes ago, one of the keystones of a brand is consistency. When you buy it in New York or you buy it in California, you have to have that same experience. And today, with the myriad of laws and rules and all the craziness, I just don't see how you're going to have a consistent experience from a product that is grown. It's a plant. It's not a synthetic product that we just manufacture. Every plant is different. So it's, it's, uh, it's still a challenge. Mm -hmm. It's still a challenge. Obviously, you know, more, more legislation, more legalization and more 
ability to work, and as, as Jean mentioned, in the different regions or cross-border, we'll start helping that. But I personally think we're, we're, we're still a ways from that. We are. It's nascent. But look at our neighbor, Canada. They figured this out. You can ship a product from Vancouver to Nova Scotia. And because it's federal. Because federal. they have a federal law. They don't have state laws. Right. Yes, they figured this out. And so why we can't is beyond me. We must make change. We have to fix this. But here's the, here's the interesting part. Both Ellen and I were there in the earliest days of the internet and of technology. And so, hey, it's nascent. So if you've got the uh, fortitude to play early and deal with some of these ups and downs, uh, I'll tell you one thing, it is so complicated. That that's why banding together to understand it is a good thing. And so I think there's, that's the fun part of being part of our few and knowing fellow investors and more. That's exciting. Yeah. Um, and what about, um, uh, you know, some of these other things like, you know, let's say HR solutions and, um, you know, some of the software and, um, you know, the, the, the point of sale type stuff. Um, what are some of the other, the, the kinds of services like, like, um, like delivery and things like that. There's all these services that, and companies that have been started to kind of fill in the gap because the main companies that service most businesses aren't touching the cannabis sector. Right. And I think that the real challenge for these companies is can they build a sticky enough product in a big enough uh, customer base such that when the other companies come into the mix, the only way for them to really get, they have to get products that people don't unplug, right? So that they, they buy those companies. Because otherwise what's gonna happen is, you know, you know, paychecks and Oracle or whatever are just gonna come in and, 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 and just compete these folks out of business. But how do you, how, how do you ascertain that in, when you're evaluating a company um, as to whether or not it's the kind of thing that with a service they're just gonna walk all over or the kind of thing they're gonna need to buy in order to get in? So I always like to look and see if there's any IP. First of all, that's an obvious moat. But second of all, I like to look and see really how sticky it is. Can it work? Can, can the company operate without that? For example, one of the companies that I really like and I'm involved in, a company called Simplifier that does a, 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 a regulation that does compliance or operating compliance, Basically, the company becomes the, 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 the product, which is a software product, a SaaS product, becomes the nervous system of the whole company. Mm -hmm. And to me, it seems obvious that that'll be something that will have to be taken out because you can't just reproduce the nervous system. Just like other companies that are doing marketing, like another company called Spring Big, that's a, a marketing company, you know, they are so entrenched in the phone and in the whole marketing fabric of right. the organization that they, they will just naturally have to get bought out. So that's what I look for. I look for companies that really get into the fabric of the company's organization and you can't pull out. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. Gene, you comment on that? I mean, you come out of the tech space, right? I mean, this is, you've lived and breathed yeah. this for, for years. Um, how is it the same or different? I see total parallel construction of if it's a technology platform, uh, to have it be a scalable best practices company. And then you have this embedded base of customers creating that stickiness. There you go. Certainly ripe for acquisition. And those partnerships can start to be created now that mm -hmm. create a future acquisition. So that's how it goes. Same story as in our tech industry. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then what about um, uh, things like, you know, fintech solutions, right? We've seen a lot of these, you know, we've just seen so many fintech solutions come through our, our, our world, right? And we've just seen a lot of them not really uh, yeah. 
grab. And, and we've seen others that, that have, and some of them are really dependent on this, on solving this banking issue right, right, right now. But what happens when the banking issues, no, listen, where do the, these businesses the go? The smartest ones have figured out how to be important to the banks and to the license holders. Yeah. Post safe banking. Who doesn't want safe banking? Let's bring on safe banking. But then some of these very cleverly produced platforms know how to take care of those compliance issues and banking issues that are still going to be needed post safe banking act. Those are the ones that are rising to the top. Mm -hmm. Great. Any thoughts on that, Alan? No, I, absolutely. I mean, I've struggled with, you know, over the years, the whole payment systems, because the, the industry is so hampered with how you can actually pay. And it's become, you know, as we discussed, a whole cash economy. But I've always been worried and hoping at the same time for the, the whole Safe Banking Act, including the addition of capital markets, which is a whole different right. conversation. Right. Absolutely. Hi, everybody. This is Lewis here. Yeah. Sorry. I uh, don't mean to interrupt, but we are nearing the end of our time. Uh, so just a reminder to wrap things up here. Yep, Thanks. totally. I was I was on it, Lewis. It was my next words after that. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Troy. All right. I get so, uh, these, I don't get a chance to hang out with these guys. But I know, I know. I, oh, I miss you. That. <laughs> Appreciate it. Um, and um, wonderful. Well, Alan, Gene, thank you so much thank for you. joining us. Thank yeah. you. This is great. Thanks for everything you guys do. Hope to be able to see you in person soon. Stay Thank safe you. out there. Um, wonderful. Well, um, it is my great pleasure um, uh, to um, pass this off to Jake Kusarak, our Director of Sponsorships, to say a bit about um, uh, Transact and to introduce uh, Justin. Well, VP of ED, but close enough. Great to thank oh, you, Troy. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> No, uh, no, trust me. And it's obviously a real pleasure to have Justin and the Transact team first back again to sponsor. And of course, Justin, thanks for joining us today. Can you start by letting thanks, us, buddy. in your own words, what is Transact first and why is it an industry leading solution? Yeah, absolutely, man. First of all, thank you very much for having me back on. Second of all, I was going to wear these, but um, I didn't want to match you. Uh, <laughs> secondly, uh, one of the things, reasons why Transact First is the leading provider is because we have 100% uptime, triple redundancy, ensuring uh, in tandem that, that dispensaries uh, are consistent and, with their, and secure with their processing. That's the first and foremost, right? Secondly, um, our ability to help dispensaries develop and execute a retail revenue maximization strategy, super important helping them increase average order value and improving customer experience. Those are super key. Um, one of the things that I've seen since we last spoke, uh, after successfully onboarding some of the industry's largest multi-state operators, is the key between integrating payments uh, with POS uh, inventory management systems. Uh, and that helps the, uh, during the delivery and, and curbside and and um, you know, helping the back office of these dispensaries maintain their books and their cash flow. Got it. Well, let's, let's break into that insight a little bit more. So certainly a lot has changed in the past, past few months across the ecosystem. What insights do you have for those operating delivery or curbside pickup services? So funny story, well, it's not, it's not really a funny story, but we did have a non-integrated, um, sorry, a non-integrated, dispensary slash POS, right? And some of the bud tenders decided to get rather cute and they were able to skim a significant amount of money, right? Which is why it's super important to, to have an integrated solution, right? If they were integrated with a, a major POS company, the delivery driver or curbside um, delivery guy wouldn't have been able to skim, um, you know, the, the cash or the checks, right? And so, what happens with us is uh, the inventory and ordering uh, technology turns on when the terminal uh, is, is activated. And so during the, the transaction, the, uh, the transaction is automatically posted. So any CFO or accounting, in-house accounting uh, can easily reconcile. Um, you know, and, and I have to say, when, within the first two weeks, of COVID-19 hitting, we had to ship out hundreds upon hundreds of uh, mobile 
enabled uh, terminals, right? So we've seen the shift between retail to, to, uh, to curbside and delivery, right? And we've been able to help them, again, maximize their, uh, their average order. Well, let's go a little bit deeper. What are some common sure. pain points you see? Uh, you know, and for example, why is it important to integrate payment providers and a POS system in parallel? It really boils down to two aspects, accounting and re reconciliation and uh, improving customer experience, right? Um, and also finding the ability to find a reliable uh, payment provider, right? Um, before Transact First entered into the market, the majority of a processor of, of uh, dispensaries, their processor would go down and they wouldn't be able to accept uh, payment and they'd have to use cash, right? And they'd, they'd wait days, weeks um, to get back up and running. And that has major impact on, on operations. So again, it really boils down to, to the accounting, the reconciliation and the redundancy and reliability. How does Transact First help small businesses, especially those struggling to get back on their feet right now? It's a good question. Um, so one of the, the newer niches that I've, I've seen uh, is the, the ATM, the cash ATM businesses. Um, since COVID hit, cash has been considered dirty uh, and a carrier of, of germs and COVID. And so all the stigma that's, that's around that, right? And what we've seen is they're looking for an added value or an add-on service to help them generate additional revenue. Um, most of the ATM companies that I've been talking to uh, have taken a 60 to 70% hit right off the bat in the last 60 days. Um, so, you know, we're really helping them offset the tremendous uh, drop in cash uh, withdrawals. I love it. Anybody who's stepping up to help, you know, so many that are struggling right now is, uh, is going to be someone we want to speak with. So at the end of the day, uh, to close things out, uh, we obviously sincerely appreciate you making time. Uh, what is going to be the best way to get in touch with you? And how do we take advantage of this promotion you're running for uh, those free mobile phone sales animals? Yeah. So anyone can email me at jf at transactfirst.com. Uh, that's J-F-T-R-A-N-S-A-C-T. F-I-R-S-T dot com. Or you can always give me a call, uh, 800-600-5126, extension 834. Again, it's 800-600-5126, extension 834. And Jake, remember, you either transact first or you transact last. <laughs> Actually, I've never heard that before. Um, well, needless to say, for anybody looking to, uh, to connect with Justin, head to transactfirst.com, or better yet, email him directly at jf at transactfirst.com. And thanks to everybody. Uh, of course, I'm going to pass things back over to Troy to close things out. Thanks again, Justin. Thank you. Muted. There we go. Um, Thank you, Jake. Thank you, Justin. Um, I love how he just gives, gives out his phone number, man. This guy is on the ball. Um, but, uh, but yeah, really, I think it's a, it's a really important time to be thinking about um, how we're transacting cash and not cash. And to have a solution for that is really, really important. So thanks again for, for sponsoring. Um, in just a few minutes, um, we're going to close this out. Um, I have a couple announcements to make um, about how to be involved with ArcView going forward and everything. But in a few minutes, we are going to uh, drop off. And um, if you're a member, if you're an ArcView member, we're just going to go hang out um, on another Zoom. And um, it's going to be fun. Um, and then a webinar just, just came up. And so feel free to, um, excuse me, a um, a survey came up. <laughs> um, would love to get your input there. It helps us serve you better. Uh, the next um, ArcView Access is ArcView Access Elite, so it's for members, and that's on June 10th uh, at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern. Um, and we're going to hear from several companies and actually like pitch a, that pitch and show how much they're raising and get Q&A. Um, and we're also going to hear from our partners at the ArcView Collective Fund. Um, we are, uh, whoops, I just lost my screen here. 
Um, and, uh, and then the next public ArcView access, uh, like this one, will be on the 17th, um, June 17th, and we're going to be talking about distressed assets um, and uh, some of the opportunities uh, with businesses uh, that are needing turnarounds, et cetera. Um, so that's going to be a very exciting topic. Um, we've also launched um, or relaunched uh, the Women's Investor Network for the digital age. <laughs> um, and um, that's for ArcView members and invited guests. You can contact our sales team to learn more about attending the monthly virtual meetings and the new WIN Women's Investor Network uh, membership package. You can send it to sales at arcviewgroup.com and mark your calendars to uh, stay tuned for details on our next WIN event, which is set for July 6th. You can also join us at the ArcView LinkedIn Lounge, where our community stays connected, shares information and insights. And also, um, I mentioned this at the beginning, but it's worth mentioning again, ArcView Market Research. It's the number one cited research for the cannabis industry. We recently released our eighth edition of the State of Legal Cannabis Markets. If you're making any expensive decisions in the cannabis sector this year, you can't do it without having this um, because it really um, gets into the details that are needed to be able to um, really make the right choices. Um, and for more information, um, uh, you can join ArcView as well um, and take advantage of the benefits of being an ArcView member. You can do that by contacting sales at ArcView group. And you're going to be getting um, a replay of this episode at some point in the next 72 hours. So if you missed anything and you want to circle back, um, that's a good time to do that. Also, if you want to take care, uh, take advantage of Transact First's offer for free terminals, um, that's, uh, you can go back and take a look at that as well. And it looks like we have some winners of, of things. Let me uh, click over here and see if they've given me any winners. Um, let's see. Um, I don't know. I don't see anything here. Um, said I was supposed to announce winners, but we're trying. Oh, okay. Got it. So they're filling out the survey. Oh, got it. Okay. Got it. They'll just be awarded directly as you fill out the survey. You'll get entered into that and then they'll just be awarded um, individually on that. Um, thank you so much for joining us today and taking time out of your schedule during this incredibly bizarre time uh, in world history. Um, please be safe out there. And um, thanks again for joining us. Uh, if you're a member, I'll see you over on the other side with Kim. Take care.